And in the next segment, uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Mr. Jared Goh, Head of Operations and Partnership at Caregivers Alliance. And together with him, we have uh, two other members of the panel, Ms. Joanna Koho, CEO of Focus on the Family Singapore, as well as Mr. Danny Lok, Head of Mental Health Department at Fei Yue. So we're going to be in for a great time as they discuss empowering the church. Please continue to use Slido to ask your questions. Um, and do note that uh, we know that Slido question can be a lot and the Slido will be open for one week after today's uh, end of the conference. So take your time to read the replies. Uh, we will arrange for as many of the questions to be replied. Okay, so continue to use Slido. Again, I will put the link into the Zoom chat for those who might have just joined us a little bit later. Okay, so Gerald, over to you, please. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, thank you, Carol, for the introduction and a very good morning to everyone uh, tuning in. My name is Jared and uh, thank you very much for having me uh, as part of this uh, sharing panel and uh, part of this conference. I'm very, very thankful I, I can come here to share. What I'll be sharing this morning uh, is it's a topic in a sense close to my heart about mental health caregiving and uh, I'll also be taking the opportunity to share about the organization that I, I I'm working for Caregivers Alliance and uh, about the programs and services that we provide and how we can be a good resource for, for you out there. And uh, I recently, just a couple of weeks ago, I, I heard somebody say that, you know, in, in this fallen world, you know, God has given us, you know, creativity to invent things and uh, to be able to cope and to survive, right, in, in this fallen world. And I would imagine in the past many hundreds of thousands of years, uh, you know, man has invented many things and uh, including medical technologies, right, to cope and to survive. And, uh, and I would think that medical technologies are, are God's gift to, to us. And, uh, and uh, it has been, I think, very helpful to, in many sense. Uh, but there's also a saying that medication only treat, right, only treat our problems and uh, while it is God who heals, right. So, so I think we should be very thankful uh, to God for the availability of uh, such medical technology and for its intervention and restoration of health, uh, right? And uh, but there is something else that is uh, you know a very important element that we always tend to forget, right? Um, when it comes to the whole treatment process of any illness, including mental health, right? And that is the 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 caregiver, right? Whenever we fall ill, you know, be it someone in the family, be it a spouse, parent, you know, child or sibling, right? Uh, somebody will be taking care of us, right? And the focus is always on the person who is not well. Right? But we never really quite think about how the person who is caring for us or the, or the persons who are caring for us, how they feel, what, what they go through and the frustrations and so on. So in the next couple of minutes, I, I just want to share a perspective from the importance or role of a, a caregiver and how agencies like Caregivers Alliance, you know, can can be can help uh, caregivers and the family out there, perhaps also the, the church and also the church members as well. Right. Um, okay, so my my sharing is titled "Caregivers: The Hidden Heroes," and uh, I I think uh, some of us who are caregivers amongst us today, I think we know that. Caregivers experience immense challenges and frustrations in caring for their loved ones, right? Especially with mental health conditions. And the situation can be, you know, can be very bad and make worse due to the stigmatizing perception of uh, mental illnesses. Uh, I mean, these caregivers are actually silent sufferers who usually not only have to care for themselves, they have to care for the family, they have to worry about the work, their finances, and uh, care for the loved one with mental health conditions. And very often, these caregivers suffer silently. Uh, but they are also hidden heroes because of their silent and selfless devotion, right, to the to their time and effort in caring for their loved ones with mental health conditions. So I was thinking that uh, nice to show some uh, demographic, some data that Caregivers Alliance have collected over the years, over the past nine years. Uh, we we have uh, been supporting caregivers in training and in outreaching and uh, providing emotional support to them. And uh, so I just quickly show some. Uh, so show some caregiver profiles here. 
you can see the left chart, uh, you'll notice that the majority of the caregivers are female, over 70% of them. I think this is uh, probably quite uh, common, quite natural. I think natural trend that women typically play more of the caring role. Uh, although I, I know some people might debate this, but uh, I think that this is what we, we have, the, the data that we have. The next chart shows the diagnosis of the loved one with mental health condition. So you'll notice that uh, the biggest chunk is actually uh, depression at 27%. Right? It's the largest group that we have been supporting so far and also followed by schizophrenia at 22% and dementia at 20%. Uh, I think most of you might be familiar that in the, the recent Singapore Mental Health Study in 2016 conducted by the Institute of Mental Health, depression came up tops as well as the most prevalent uh, mental disorder in Singapore. So this is quite consistent with the group of caregivers that we're supporting. And uh, I think this, in fact, this figure has gone up quite a bit, especially uh, due to this COVID-19 uh, pandemic over the past year or so. Right. And then for the age of caregivers, you'll notice the two biggest groups are actually the, uh, 40, the 41 to 60 uh, age group. This uh, covering more than half of the caregivers, in fact. Right? And this, this caregivers typically belong to that sandwich generation you know, who are actually caring for their aged parents or are supporting their own children or their siblings. Right? And this age group is also probably the one that faces the most challenges by virtue of their roles in the family. And for the last chart showing the relationship, the caregiver's relationship with their loved ones, right? the parent and child are the two largest groups at 34% and 27% respectively, uh, with spouses and siblings uh, at 13% each, right? forming the other major groups. So from this simple caregiver profile, we know that caregiver can be anyone in the family or, or even friends or relatives, and they can belong to any age group. right? Uh, mental illness does not discriminate and uh, they can affect anyone at any one time. And uh, so this includes the Christian communities as well. And I think that's why, I mean, this conference is really, uh, I'm glad that we have this conference to bring together you know, the Christian community to, to really understand uh, you know, mental health and how uh, the various resources available out there you know, can be of help. So over the years, we have been asking you know, what do caregivers need? And, uh, and uh, many of us uh, working at Cal are also caregivers ourselves. And, uh, we, we sort of gathered this information so far that many of them actually, the first thing on their mind is that they want to be better at caregiving, right? You know, they, they want to be able to acquire some knowledge and skills to be able to change the mindset and attitude towards mental illness, towards caregiving. And they want to have a sort of a support network where they can share their experience and they can learn and get support from other people. They also want to be able to care for themselves. Uh, just now, just earlier topic, it was a lot about self-care and even for pastors and the you know, these free workers, but I think for caregivers, we also need to practice a lot of self-care. We need to find time for respite, relief you know, from caregiver burden. And we want to be able to find purpose and meaning. Right? How their caregiving role, I think the, uh, the journey of a caregiver is a long one. So I think we need to find purpose and meaning. And I, I like to show this, this emotional journey of a caregiver slide uh, because uh, it's Typically, what, uh, what we believe that a caregiver would go through the emotional journey, right, of this crisis coping and advocating, that there's different stages of the uh, caregiving journey. And, um, and if you look at the, the lower part of it, right, you realize that uh, there are many different arrows going in different directions. And, and it simply tells us that these stages are not, um, not sequential. It means, uh, you, you don't move from one stage of crisis to coping to advocating, and then, then you remain there. But basically, there are many different emotions that come along with it. And, uh, you know, and sometimes when a relapse happen or a crisis happen at home, you, you may go back to the previous stage, right? And, uh, and, and so this, this sort of reminds me that, uh, you know, back in, back in 1998, uh, my sister was diagnosed with uh, major depression by, by a GP, but the family did not know about it for quite a while. And because she was living on her own, it was only some years later, you know, when we started started calling out for help that we came to know that she might, you know, have a, a mental health condition, but the whole family was in denial, uh, including my sister herself, right? We were in shock, we were confused, you know, we were at a loss of what to do. You know, and I say, how can it be? Right? And then uh, I, I remember um, just telling my sister, hey, come on, snap out of it, right? How, you know, how, can, how difficult can it be, right? Everybody is stressed, don't think too much. Uh, things will improve, right? But uh, these are all the bad advice that we, we tend to give to our our loved ones right, when, when, they, when they face a lot of problems. But it didn't help, right? Uh, 
but also at the same time, she didn't really seek medical treatment and uh, we just kept hoping that, oh, okay, let's, let's hope things will get better. Uh, the stigma in the, uh, towards mental illness in your family was very strong. Uh, we didn't even dare to talk about it in the family and uh, we just kept hoping you know, that, that she would be well. Uh, but fast forwarding many years down the road, uh, with many crises in between, uh, some suicidal intents and so on, uh, my sister was finally uh, awarded at IMH and it was quite a traumatizing experience for her and also for the family. Um, and there was much guilt and, you know, and anger in the family. And uh, my parents were already in the late 70s and had their own medical conditions, right? And uh, my brother was working and living in Taiwan. So the burden naturally fell upon me right, as to be the caregiver. I was barely coping myself and I kept asking, why me? Why me? Right? And, but I, I realized along the way, I, I, I came to terms that it's really something that I needed to do for, for my sister and for the family. Um, and uh, I think back in... And then in 2013, when she had another suicidal episode, uh, a psychiatrist uh, who happens also to be in this conference today uh, introduced me to Caregivers Alliance. All right? And uh, Caregivers Alliance uh, at that time just started a caregiver support center at, at the IMH. And uh, I, you know, I approached them, I, I spoke with them, and they encouraged me to join a, a training program called the Caregivers to Caregivers Training Program. Uh, this was a 12 week program. So this is a, a the 12 week program is a, called C2C for short, right? I think it not only imparted knowledge and skills about mental health, but it also promoted experiential learning, emotional healing, something that I really greatly needed at that time. And uh, it also encouraged caregiver to caregiver support. And the trainers were caregivers themselves, right? We have experience of caring for someone with mental illnesses. And so um, after attending the training, I think the most important takeaway for me was that uh, I changed my mindset towards mental illness and towards caregiving. Uh, it allowed me to have a better acceptance of my sister's situation and my own caregiving journey. I was able to heal emotionally. I, I started to volunteer. I, I became an advocate. I started to share and, uh, and then I became a staff at Cal. And uh, since then, I've been trying to find the joy in, you know, of caregiving. And uh, today, I'm very thankful that my sister is coping well and uh, we are supporting each other, right? Yeah. So. How has Cal been supporting and helping caregivers out there? And I just mentioned the C2C training that I attended. Right? So since 2012, this program has been uh, you know, going on. And uh, we, we also um, recently started the training also for, for persons, uh, caregivers of persons with dementia and also for the young caregivers and youth. Uh, and uh, we have also extended this training to, to, the, to people at the hospitals, at the corporations, communities. You know, different faith-based groups as churches as well and uh, also institutes of higher learning and uh, we've moved online because of the online pandemic right we move all our training classes online so just a quick look at the at the lesson sort of the 12 week lesson right i mentioned 12 weeks this is for the uh, caregiving class for persons with mental health issues uh, it's basically uh, helps the caregiver to have a better understanding of mental health caregiving how to manage a mental health crisis and even learn a little bit about the brain and you know what goes on in the brain about medication. And it also covers some soft skills like uh, problem solving, practicing uh, empathy, and uh, knowing how to communicate more effectively with their loved ones. And uh, again, self-care, you know, they're always reminded of the importance of self-care and, and encouraged to advocate you know, to, for better services of you know, mental health. And uh, there's always a graduation ceremony at the end of all our training. Uh, and then for dementia, this is an eight-week training. Uh, with, there were actually many uh, caregivers who were attending the, the previous C2C program, the 12-week program, but we felt that uh, you know, a more dementia-specific curriculum would support the caregivers better. And uh, while both are you know, uh, sort of mental health-related, uh, I think there are different physical and emotional challenges for the caregivers. So we, 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 did, uh, we started a new program for this. And then uh, young caregivers as well. Uh, Sorry, Jared, because... I need to stop you. Uh, you got one more minute. We need to... Uh, okay, sure. Friends. So sorry. Yeah, okay. I, uh, yeah, I, I think you need to speak faster. So I, I think, yeah, so for young caregivers and then a lot of training and, and uh, we, you know, we have gone on to online training and so on. Uh, and I think it's, it's important that uh, we, we really change our mindset towards, uh, you know, about caregiving. And, and I think it's very important that uh, we, we uh, you know, I mean, as caregivers, if, you, if you're able to accept that uh, you know, mental illness is what, what it is all about, and it's an illness, and as caregivers, what we can do, I think that's very important. So uh, all this about engagement, we, we, we basically continue to engage all our caregivers. We, we, 
we do all kinds of activities for them, equip them with skills and allow them to volunteer and so on, uh, volunteering at all our events, right? But we also need to, you know, find all these caregivers out there because they don't really, readily just come, come to us, right? And uh, so uh, we, we, we go to the IMH, we go to, you know, hospitals, we look for them in the hospitals, we go to the community, we go to corporates, and we have been uh, also talking to different churches, faith-based groups, you know, to, to share and, and you know, to, to, to talk about mental health, talk about caregiving, right? And uh, also talk to youth, uh, you know, in the past two years, we've been working on that. So, I mean, if you're a caregiver, you know, you, you know that it, it definitely involves a lot of time, a lot of commitment, a lot of sacrifice, even money. Uh, you know, the role can be, can be tough, can be intimidating, but know that you're not alone, right? And uh, there's always help and support to, to walk alongside you, right? So, since this is a, a, a Christian conference, I just want to show, show here uh, just a slide on all the different churches uh, that we have uh, worked with over the past couple of years. And in fact, um, it's uh, not, I mean, the, our, our work with our churches could be in the form of a talk or in the form of a sharing session, a panel, or even, even the C2C training at the church itself. And uh, so uh, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, we, we really hope to be able to work with uh, churches in, you know, to be able to help, see how we can help the pastor, how the ministry team, and you know, how we can help your members, right? Uh, thank so, you very much, uh, Jared. Right. Thank you. Yeah, yep. we'll continue this in uh, your breakout room later. Yeah, sure. yeah. So sorry to interrupt because no uh, we need to give time for the next two panelists as well. No problem. Yes. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm finished. So, <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we just uh, sorry about that, but uh, I think we, we you can hear more uh, from Jared at the uh, breakout room as well. So with that, let me just uh, now invite. Uh, Joanna from Focus on the Family to share with us uh, what their organization can do to help to empower the church. Over to you, Joanna. Thank you. Um, just a minute. Okay. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I thought it was that kind of uncanny that, um, yeah, because um, I don't think, I think many people know that I've been a uh, for the longest time, focus on the family, but uh, few would know that I actually started off my career in the area of uh, psychiatric care, and the founder of Caregivers Alliance uh, was my boss at one point of time, <laughs> my first boss. Okay, so uh, let me just jump straight into it. Uh, focus on the family, as you know, is a faith-based uh, Christian organization, but we uh, cater to the community because we are set up as a community organization, and uh, I wanted to just uh, bring us back to a mental health survey that we conducted. Uh, last year and a second time round uh, this year. And so last year when we first conducted it, it was uh, before COVID hit the world and hit our shores. And this year, obviously, uh, it has been almost like, um, you know, one year into living with COVID where we conducted a second round of it. And what we found, and some of you might have heard this shared at our State of Family earlier this year that we conduct annually for our church and Christian partners. Uh, but mental health is a growing concern. Um, I know we've heard a lot of buzz about it publicly, especially uh, with regards to mental health amongst our youth. Um, but uh, what we did in our mental health survey was a, to survey church workers, church uh, leaders, church ministers, church pastors, and uh, that we found is also a, not a very happy state of affairs. Uh, we know that uh, because uh, talking about caregivers, right, pastors, uh, ministry leaders, you are the caregivers to many people in your church. Uh, you are the shepherd over the flock. And uh, you do need care too as a caregiver, just as Jared has shared. And uh, as you can tell from this slide, um, uh, as church leaders and ministry staff, you we recognize that you do also need support in the area of uh, mental health and self-care. Um, but I just want to bring us back to uh, what we can do from a family front. Uh, one of the things that focus on the family is championing, uh, emphasizing this year is really youth suicide. Um, that's of course, most of it stems from mental health issues, but we have uh, felt that the need to ta 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 tackle this issue, not from uh, not to the youth directly, but actually to the parents. And uh, that's where, um, of course, while we recognize that, you know, it's really youth suicide that we are trying to reduce or hopefully even eliminate, um, we want to um, see how we can equip and help parents to come into the picture such that they are not seen as the problem, but 
as the solution. And um, this is where, you know, looking at the parents, we do know that just like, you know, the caregivers in the church, i.e. our church leaders, ministry workers, our pastors, um, are also under stress caring for others. Uh, parents are under stress too. And Jared has uh, mentioned that they probably fall under that sandwich generation where it's not just caring for children, but sometimes also caring for the elderly. Uh, so our approach is really a suicide prevention for young people, but um, targeting parents who will be that first line of defense for their children. And um, we are specifically looking at uh, parents with kids in the transitionary age groups because with every transition brings stress, whether entering primary school for the first time, um, transiting from you know, being a child, going through adolescence to becoming a teenager, and of course the rocky teenage years as they are often called. Now, uh, as an organization, we are pretty much focused on preventive work. And thus, when it comes even to suicide prevention, we want to go as far upstream as possible. Uh, we know that there is obviously a need and a critical urgent need at that to address you know, um, the issue when it does occur, when it is crisis particularly especially. Um, we can go upstream a little bit and to talk about early intervention, even helping you know, um, parents, uh, training young people themselves to watch out for signs of distress amongst their peers. But where we are coming from is that we really want to go as upstream as possible and to build resilience uh, in children, in young people. And that's where parents, of course, uh, come in strongest. And so if we're trying to build uh, resilience in our young people, uh, where we are coming from is to equip parents to be able to build what we call uh, developmental assets so that our children have these um, assets for healthy living. Healthy living, not just physically, but healthy living mentally, emotionally, um, and even for Christians, spiritually. Okay, and this is uh, based on a body of research called the developmental assets. And how we do that is that uh, we want to equip parents to be able to build family assets through the developmental relationship that they hold with their children. And in so doing, yeah, uh, through these developmental relationships, through ongoing inputting of family assets, um, the children will eventually, will um, subsequently uh, increase in their developmental assets. Okay, so essentially, instead of reducing risk factors, we want to build and increase protective factors for the child. And this is essentially what we call bounds. Okay, our uh, terminology for resilience and why we call it BOUNCE because BOUNCE stands for uh, beliefs, okay, helping children to develop a healthy uh, mindset about themselves, to view themselves the way, you know, as Christians particularly, God views them with that value and worth that is intrinsic, not based on what they do, but who they are. Uh, we want to equip them, of course, with a good self-taught growth mindset. O stands for outdoors, very important. I know COVID keeps us indoors, yeah, but the, we are allowed to go outdoors, maybe with a mask on, but there is a value in breathing fresh air, even if we can't go our house, maybe just to poke our head out the window to breathe fresh air. Yeah, that in itself can do wonders. Space that outdoors provides does wonders for mental health. Um, usefulness to give our kids a sense of purpose and meaning. Of course, from a Christian context, this means helping them to find their purpose in Christ. Nighttime, uh, which actually represents the whole idea of sleep. We know adults are sleep deprived. Our surveys are showing that moms as well as dads uh, are sleep deprived. Pastors are sleep deprived. I think we are a sleep deprived nation. Yeah, but uh, we can't emphasize enough, and this is backed by medical research about the importance of sleep sleep and so nighttime routines are really important and that's where parents come in to um, establish some of these routines in our home. Uh, C stands for community, you know, helping our children to find good friends, make good friends and in uh, doing so building their support network, uh, particularly in teenage years when, you know, they begin to unclip from us as parents and to individuate, they will need good friends around them. And last and uh, but not least, E will stand for emotions. Uh, helping parents to teach their children how to identify, label, uh, process their emotions, yeah, um, to also adopt a sense of uh, gratefulness and to have an internal locus of control. Uh, particularly important in our uh, pandemic that I know has become an endemic times, right? Because it's, it, it, when you feel that everything is, you know, externally uh, 
uh, imposed upon us, then we find that we lose control and that's where helplessness begins to be learned. But instead, we want parents to help um, to have build in their children you know, internal locus of control that they can process in their emotions of what is happening to them and respond accordingly and in a healthy manner. Okay, of course, uh, uh, this is all very nice on paper, you know, but uh, how do parents go about doing it? And we know that parents essentially struggle in the three main areas. Um, knowledge is one, yeah, to have knowledge of what exactly is mental health, you know, what is depression, what's anxiety, what do I do? Uh, that's great to have the skills, yeah, to support their children. But I think what we have discovered is that parents find that, you know, to be able to apply their knowledge and also to use their skills uh, becomes curved if they do not have that relationship with their child. You know, so this developmental relationship between parent and child is critical. And uh, I wanted to just play this very short clip for us. Um, to have parents and maybe adults who are in this room, I believe all, most of us are probably adults, if not all. Um, yeah, so to play this clip, to hear it from the youth's point of view as to how parents can help to support them when it comes to mental health. I, I think that I was never really close to my parents. Um, the reason is... Oopsie. The reason is... Are still unknown to me. I really don't know why we grew so far apart, but... Uh, I think part of it was because my mom, uh, she was, she was uh, what you would call a tiger mom when I was young. Uh, not the worst tiger mom, la, but I would constantly get scolded. And so, like, I, I felt that, like, that, that, that was the reason why, like, I, I didn't want to share any problems with her. Because uh, the fear of, like, just getting scolded, like, you open up to them and then they immediately scold you. So, like, that was kind of why I did not really open up to my friends. But um, things changed, you know, and, like, attitudes, people changed, and then, like, um, I think there was where like I decided, you know, to open up. Yeah. Okay, so how can parents get their children to open up with them? They need to establish a foundation of relationship. Um, and one of the things that we are trying to do is really to support parents in this whole area of helping to build resilience in their children, uh, build those developmental assets that will be protective factors over their child's mental health. Okay, so we have some resources. You can check them out. Uh, this is another one of them. Uh, what you, The clip that you saw came out of a Facebook Live uh, show that we did on mental health. Uh, we have have Spotify podcast. This particular one specifically talks about, you know, um, journey with your child through a mental health issue. Um, we want to help uh, parents build that connection with their child, uh, mainly through conversations. So through a survey, we actually, it actually revealed to us that both sons and daughters, you know, whether it's with dad or mom, uh, conversations, you know, not just uh, functional conversations and whether or not uh, they're coming back for dinner, got CCA today, done homework, okay? But really conversation that can lead to heart-to-heart -heart connection. Uh, it's what sons and daughters would really desire from dad and mom in order to feel connected with their parents, okay? And what should these conversations uh, revolve around? Well, uh, if we can build that, that relationship with a child, some of these conversations that can then go into the more uh, controversial topics <laughs> or the issues that oftentimes I know maybe as Asian families, we don't talk about enough. And, you know, it can start with talking about friends, talking about digital use, okay? chatting about it, not, not berating them about it. <laughs> uh, to, uh, you know, the more difficult issues, uh, like even talking about the topic of suicide itself. Okay, so this is where we are hoping to equip parents. And I'm going to leave you with some resources uh, that Focus has uh, for both parents and also for um, organizations where you are trying to take care of the parents in your organization or churches with parents and your members. Okay, so one of the things, like I said, if conversation is the problem, we do want to help to encourage, to equip, to put resources in the hands of families to have conversations within the family. Yeah, so uh, recently we just uh, had our Youth Day campaign and uh, with a, in partnership with uh, another organization, we have a telebot um, uh, uh, on Telegram, yeah, a bot um, that um, basically uh, is a, family card game around conversations okay so you can check this out on our telegram yeah the links are all there um recently we also uh, much as i said we're trying to target parents we've done a youth uh, virtual conference 
Um, and one of the things that we spotlighted on was uh, this whole area of mental health. And again, it's having uh, young people share their stories to, so parents can hear it from the perspective of a young person and know how best to come alongside yeah, their child or their teenager or even their young adult. Okay, uh, so if you like to know more and uh, if you like to have a resource kit, if there are any educators here, uh, there will be a resource kit that will be launched uh, shortly. Yeah, you can contact our FemChamps team. Uh, as a follow-up to also that conference, there's a base camp coming up towards the end of the year. So if you like more information, you can um, um, contact our FemChamps team. Um, directly addressing this topic would be a couple of webinars that we have had the um, uh, blessing of uh, some funding from a foundation to do. Okay, so these are two of them publicly run ones that will be coming up in the next couple of months. But we also do do run these for organizations. We've conducted this for a couple of churches. Again, if you'd like more information, please feel free to contact us. If not, you can you know, scan the QR codes that you see on screen. Um, related to mental health is this whole area of relational health. Okay, particularly when it comes to sex, because we've actually, um, well, research has actually shown that sexual issues tend to have a correlation with mental health issues. So if you want to tackle this subset of a mental health issue, yeah, this will actually be next Saturday. Again, uh, today, actually, um, my team has said you can use this promo code uh, PARTNER10 to get $10 off. Okay, so if you like to, you can scan the QR code. I'm going to just pause here for a split second. Okay, and uh, some other resources. Um, I know there's been a lot of things that I've just flashed on screen very quickly, but if uh, it's been too much, you can just scan this QR code, okay, uh, or go to wholelife.sg slash subscribe. Um, there is an open-ended field where you can put that. I think I missed the QR code for whatever it is that you're interested in, for be it the, the educator's kit for young people, um, the mental health webinar. Yeah, you can just put it in and then uh, one of... Um, us from the focus team will get back to you. Okay, uh, but that aside, well, since this is a Christian conference, like Jared said, um, every month we pray for the state of family. Uh, we just pray for the state of youth and of course mental health amongst youth. Uh, but uh, because October will be a mental health emphasis uh, globally, uh, we will have a mental health emphasis uh, for that month's prayer. So if you uh, do feel led, please do join us. We feel that while we can do a lot of these community initiatives and activities, activities on the ground really at the core of this battle you know for the mental health of our young people and our generation and our churches it starts in the place of prayer okay so we'll invite you to join us all right thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks joanna for keeping to time thank you for all your uh, input yes i think all the slides uh, can be accessible you can just write to joanna or the focus on the family now with that, uh, I'd like to pass the time now to Danny, who now come and share with us what he's doing at Fei Yue. Danny, over to you, Danny. Okay, thank you, Pastor Seng Lee. Yeah, so let me just uh, get my slide on. Yep, uh, okay. Okay, hey, hi, hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Danny from Fei Yue Community Service. I'm really thank. Uh, organizer for giving me this opportunity to share about failure and the work we are doing uh, in the uh, mental health space. Uh, but I thought I really want to thank uh, uh, Pastor David, Reverend David, uh, just for sharing about self-care. I think for all of us who are in the helping industry, I think including the pastors or, or, or even ministry leaders, even like us, you know, in, in, in the mental health uh, space is that we really need to learn to uh, take care of ourselves. You know, I think as the great commandment also say, love one another as you love yourself. So I thought that was a very uh, a great reminder for us. So thank you, Pastor. Um, okay, so now, okay, I just want to share about Fei and of course, uh, ending off my sharing, I'll be sharing a short testimony of how the church and the mental health, I think, uh, professionals can create a healing community uh, for one who suffers from mental illnesses or mental health challenges. So Fei Yue, we, our mission is to effect life transformation through the provision of quality social services. And I think many of you may have known Fei Yue you know, as a charity and maybe one of the pioneers of the family service centers and a community and also pioneer in the community counseling. Uh, and also being very active in the Chinese media and the medium. Uh, we are a secular social service agency uh, serving people from different races and, and religions. And of course, offering our services uh, both in English and Chinese. Uh, but I also like to take this opportunity to share with you okay, our journey, our values, 
and how our cultures and approaches are rooted in Christ and, and in his words. Okay, Fei Yue is uh, closely linked to the Chinese Christians' missions uh, in the United States. And the uh, Chinese Christians' mission started its uh, Singapore branch in 1977. And Fei Yue, we are actually a ministry initiated by the Chinese Christian missions to reach out to the Chinese communities in Singapore and Malaysia through educational talks, camps, publications, and performing arts. And only in the 1990s, I think through discussions with some of the local churches, I think Fei we embarked into the community service. And in 1991, we started our very first family service center at Bukit Batok. And in 19, as our program expanded and uh, services expanded, in 1996, we registered officially as a society and also as a charity. And this year, we are actually celebrating our 30th anniversary. And we thank God for His grace and uh, seeing us through all this year serving the the, the various groups like children with special needs, the youth, families, people with healthcare and mental health needs, and the elderly. So we really want to thank God, I think, for, for His grace and His favor upon us for the past 30 years. Okay, our community mental health programs are mainly funded by AIC, the Agency of Integrated Care. And we really want to support and empower individuals at risk or diagnosed with mental health challenges uh, living in the community. Uh, we have three main programs, the CREST, CREST Youth, which is new, I will share uh, a bit later, and also COMMIT, which is an allied uh, uh, health professional led team. So you can see from here is that we serve a really from quite a wide age group from 16 uh, to all, all, all the way up to even to the elderly, even among our mental health programs. CREST stands for the Community Resource Engagement and Support Team. Uh, it is served as a community safety net for people with or at risk with mental illness or mental health challenges, just such as depression and dementia, etc., uh, who are living in the community. At CREST, we serve adults 25 years old and above, and we aim to increase public awareness of uh, mental illnesses and uh, mental health uh, and the available resources through talks, outreach events. And through these talks and outreach events, we will also promote the uh, recognition uh, of signs and symptoms of the various health, mental health conditions. In the same vein, we also provide coordinated care, information, and support through basic screening, emotional support, follow-up, service linkages, and even monitoring for those who require long-term care in the uh, community. We also network with community partners and religious organizations like churches uh, to conduct and coordinate uh, mental health training, mental health awareness talks, and educational events. Currently, we have six CREST teams serving the various areas in Singapore, uh, namely uh, Amokyo and Aukang, Bukit Panjang, Chua Chu Kang, Clementi and Ulu Pandang, Queenstown, and Serangoon and Paleba. If your churches are within this area, you can always con uh, 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 contact us to see how we can really collaborate and even to conduct some of all these uh, talks and even uh, uh, <coughs> and events together on mental health. Next, I will talk about CREST Youth. Crest Youth is a new program started by AIC just this year. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we were appointed in April as one of the agencies to provide these Crest Youth services. Similarly, it's the, the Crest Youth is to provide a community safety network for the youth at risk uh, of all with mental illnesses and mental health challenges, and also to serve as a community node, uh, linking these youth and their families to the appropriate health and social support network. At Crest Youth, we serve youth from 12 years to 25 years old, and uh, particularly for those who are not in the workforce. So that means basically those are still in uh, uh, studying or, or even in the tertiary education. And most of the services provided are similar to, to the other Crest team, except that in the Crest Youth, we will work very closely with the parents and their peers uh, in, in the recovery journey of the youth. And of course, we will also network with schools, community partners, and religious organization to conduct and coordinate the uh, mental health trainings and educational events. Currently, the Crest Youth serve mainly in the East region, covering Bedok, Changi, Pasiris, Paleba, and Tampanese area. And the Crest Youth also utilize this uh, EC2.SG online platform. Okay, we use this uh, online platform 
uh, to conduct out online outreach on TikToks and Instagram to promote mental health and awareness, of course, targeted towards the youth. Uh, these are the two platforms the youth uh, frequent. And it also serves as an anonymous text based on some online counseling for youth to share their thoughts and struggles. And, and I think uh, ec2.sg uh, is uh, current because it's online, it does serve the youth across the whole island. Next, I will talk about COMMIT. COMMIT actually stands for <coughs> excuse me, the Community Mental Health Intervention Team. As I shared earlier, it is an uh, allied health uh, uh, professionals-led team. And um, we provide holistic support okay, for the person with mental illness and mental health challenges and their caregivers so that they can be integrated and remain in the community. So what the COMMIT do is that we serve persons from 16 years old and above and we provide support to the uh, primary care uh, physicians uh, from the GPs or polyclinics, and even some of them are, are even seeing, <clears throat> maybe seeing a uh, psychiatrist or seeking psychiatric help or psychological psychologists, seeing psychologists in the uh, NUHS or even IMH. In managing these uh, clients and the patients uh, uh, with mental illness and uh, challenges, I think, in the community. In the same vein, the COMMIT also provides individualized psychosocial therapies, counseling and case management for the persons uh, that we are seeing. On top of that, we also provide training and workshops on topics such as maintaining mental wellness, mental well-being, identifying signs and symptoms of stress and mental health challenges in the workplace, and managing anxiety, etc. Recently, we have uh, conducted trainings and workshops for the uh, Love Singapore a Marketplace Initiative and also staff from Wesley Methodist Church. COMMIT um, also supports our five family service centres uh, from in Bukit Patok, Champions Way, Chua Chu Kang, UT and Taman Jurong. And we also take in cases and referral from the, uh, these uh, areas, Bukit Batok, Brickland, Chua Chu Kang, Get Hong, Limbang, Taman Jurong and UT. And if you really have uh, find that uh, whether members uh, who, who need uh, this kind of services, you can always contact us. And our services, because it's funded, so it is free. If, uh, if really cost is a concern uh, for some of the members in seeking, I think, professional help. And ending off my sharing, I would like to share a case uh, which one of my comic colleagues uh, closed recently. <clears throat> it's the story of June. June, of course, is uh, just a, 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 a pseudonym, okay, but it's a real case, a real person. Um, she's a 25 years old university student. And in the early 2018, her family brought her to Fayette to seek counseling help after recommendation uh, by her psychiatrist. She was initially diagnosed with depression in uh, 2016. And in the late 2018, uh, it was uh, actually diagnosed to be uh, having, she's uh, diagnosed to be having a bipolar disorder. At that point of time, she left her first church and she felt that no one in the church truly understands her or her condition. And she felt that she was treated, you know, just like another problematic members in the church. After some months of counseling and support from, I think, uh, 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 <coughs> my colleagues, she revealed to her that she was actually uh, recommended by uh, a friend to attend her current church. And, and just coincidentally, this friend uh, was previously also experiencing uh, depression uh, 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 <coughs> situation. Uh, so my colleague encourages her to be in this new community. And uh, however, initially, it was difficult for June as she has trust issues with others due to her growing up history. However, her cell group peers you know, continue to reach out to her and show her their consistent care and concern for her in a way that she has never experienced before. And one of them even took the initiative to meet her weekly to go through Bible study and continue to encourage her uh, on, on this to go uh, uh, in her, in, in her this, uh, recovery journey. And now, you know, June really find a safe place and a place where she has authentic friendship uh, that she can really uh, be healed. June is uh, finally discharged, I think, from COMMIT last month. It took her over three years to reach this stage of recovery. A recovery for a person with mental illness or mental, with mental health challenges takes time and requires multiple areas of support. And for June, three years 
it seems a long time to it's, it's long time but it's actually quite fortunate and we thank god that it's considered short you know for some of the cases that we are seeing and through the consistency shown by june's current uh, cell group members their presence with her through her high and low mood and giving her additional measure of grace these are words she 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 shared herself really giving her the additional measure of grace and being patient with her she is then really able to find a safe place for her to recover and and with our counselor you know really helping her the, the role of our counselor is really to help her to make sense of her conditions and providing signposts to help her navigate through her situation and using the right counseling modalities to correct some of the uh, ruminative thinking that she has and while all this while june is still seeing her psychiatrist for medication and indeed it takes the church and i think the mental health practitioners to form a healing community uh, to that help june in this recovery journey and the church and the mental health practitioners i think we can really work together and complement each other for members and uh, even uh, for people in the community that is going through mental uh, uh, health challenges. And with this, I would just like to end off with this quote uh, from Helen Keller. I think indeed it says that, you know, alone, we can do so little, but together we can do so much. And uh, lastly, so you want to find out uh, more about how Fayyue can help and support uh, your churches, I think, uh, or even your organization, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. And uh, we can conduct, I think, uh, really uh, some of the talks and, and even uh, 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 the trainings in, in Mandarin. And because, yeah, they're still, still one of our strengths and our roots. Uh, so, yeah, uh, just thank you for this time. And I hope that uh, you're blessed uh, to even to hear that, I think, uh, yeah, uh, a person with mental illness and or with mental health challenge just, I think, can, can, can be healed and, and can, can, uh, uh, can be healed and can, can, can find a healing community for them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Danny, as well as Joanna and uh, Gerald, uh, for the sh sharing on different perspective, community as well as family and caregivers. Uh, there are many questions that are in slide. So let me bring up the top voted question. If there is no caregiver for a person with mental health issues and the church become their next lifeline, what would be your advice for the church to manage the expectations and demands? Uh, perhaps I could uh, invite Gerald to weigh in on this first. Okay. Uh, I was thinking perhaps the pastor would be a better person to answer this. But uh, I mean, we, when, when we do work with some churches in, in this, uh, conducting the training, we, we, we will also want, uh, we can have actually specific training for church members as well who, who can actually play the role of, of the caregivers, right? Uh, who, whom, I mean, and in, in this case, specifically uh, people without care, I mean, caregivers and who, who needs uh, the support from the church. So it will be good for the church members or volunteers to, to be trained with some mental health expect, and then to, especially in a way to better understand, uh, you know, how to communicate, how to empathize with, with, the, with the person with mental health condition. I, I would think that that is one area we can work with the church on. Uh, maybe I, I could also ask Pastor Sing Lee uh, from pastor's perspective. <laughs> I interview my own MC, uh, co MC. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks. Uh. Actually, there are a lot of pastors in this room. Uh, I, I was just saying that uh, uh, how do you define the church? The church actually is defined by the community of believers. So it is really learning to look out for uh, like minded believers who have a burden for this particular person. That together as a community, we can love the community the person and uh, work with the person. But having said that, I, I want to uh, promote the work of the Caregiver Alliance. I think that's where going for their training will help you uh, with the right skill set and the knowledge to really uh, help the person in need. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, can the speaker share more on the church partnership? How do church partner with uh, your various organizations and uh, yeah, and integrate the faith elements in the work that you do. Uh, perhaps, uh, Joanna, would you like to uh, weigh in a little bit more on how churches can work with focus?
Uh, okay. Uh, perhaps um, Danny, would you like to share first? I think we lost Joanna for a bit. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think there's a few areas that churches can uh, work with. Uh, I mean, uh, service or uh, social ser service agency like us. I think one is uh, first uh, be aware of the services that we are offering. And of course, I think, uh, sad to say, in some, some of our contexts, uh, uh, we are bounded by certain, I think, uh, geographic uh, boundaries, you know, in the area of our service. So if you are, let's say, find out that, you know, uh, like say our family service center is uh, within certain area, or even like just now, as I shared about the call and the crest, uh, I think first, I think we can really, I think, just link up and then we can discuss how we can partner. And actually our team do uh, actively, I think, uh, reach out to, to churches, I think, uh, uh, within our areas to, to offer such awareness talks or, or even possible partnership yeah because i think uh, uh and, and i think yeah i think since this is a, um, a christian mental health i think conference we can share i think we do have a little bit of bias when we reach out to our community partners when we want to offer our, our services and help so so we'll definitely look out for churches so i think that is on the first level that we can uh, work on and and the other is that of course like i say even once you know uh, there's a certain uh, uh, the church within our so-called our service boundaries, uh, you can really contact us directly. I think whether through our family service centers or even <clears throat> through through the link in the common knowledge to make reference. If you find that uh, your church members is uh, undergoing uh, through uh, some of these challenges, if we find ourselves not being the uh, right agency, we will help to make at least to help to make the reference to a right uh, a, a right site. You know the cases so that you know. Uh, whether the members of family or the church, you don't need to go for a, a big round you know, looking for services to help your members. So I think that is at least the first level that we can, I think, work together. Thank you so much, Danny. Uh, Joanna, I'm glad that you are back. I saw that you also post uh, some things in the Zoom chat. So if everyone could take a look at what Joanna has shared on how Focus can support the church, uh, would you like to add uh, anything else besides what you posted in the Zoom chat, Joanna? I'm sorry, I dropped out of uh, Zoom for a while with connect bad connection. Um, uh, we are really coming in from the as upstream as possible, and you know, with mental health issues being so prevalent these days, and particularly because of COVID, right? A lot of people uh, are being challenged in this area. Um, we really want to uh, urge that I'm, I'm really, I really encourage there are so many of us in this conference, but we do want to urge um, people to be proactive. Like, don't wait until you discover that somebody in your family or in your congregation, your cell group has a mental health issue before you take action. Action, uh, or before you tell yourself that, oh no, now I need to do something. Um, I think the issue is prevalent enough for all of us to be equipped to become more knowledgeable in this area. Um, and because we are focused on the family, we do believe that the first line of support needs to come from home because that's really where uh, we should be able to pick up signs, particularly these days when, you know, I know churches are still struggling to go back on site. Um, on screen, you may not be able to detect if a person is beginning to struggle or already struggling. Uh, but since everyone is stuck at home, all the more, let's keep a look out at the people around us and, and be a bit sensitive like, hey, how, did, how are they doing? And sometimes um, it requires us to open our mouth and, and ask specifically, you know, not just like I said, ask about the, the perfunctory uh, things, practical things, but to ask about how are you feeling, you know, you know how has it been for you, uh, to ask about their emotions and how they're handling things, yeah, um, and so um, where we're coming from, um, really we're going for uh, mass education, yeah, particularly starting with parents because they can do so much to initiate those conversations, um, the youth are hoping that the parents speak to them even though they might not appear to be so, but they do really want um, that care and uh, love, they know the parents love them, but they, they need an outlet. Yeah, and so this is where, um, I mean, I've listed some resources, please do follow us. I mean, there's so many, so I'm afraid that you'll probably get lost if I start sending you individual links, but I've listed some of them, there's a Zoom chat. Um, and if I could encourage you to even try out something practical today, go to the Telegram. Uh, I, I'll put out the Telegram bot uh, link in a while. Yeah, but just start those conversations. If we don't talk, we'll never know. And the thing about uh, people who are going through uh, mental health issues is that isolation becomes a real uh, big obstacle to them receiving the help they need. Uh, I say this because I think we do need, as even as a church community, you know, wanting to show love, um, that we need to provide those safe places and open up 
you know, conversations. Um, um, in fact, as I'm speaking right now, uh, my husband is seeing a counsellor. Uh, tomorrow, my, my son will see a counsellor. Okay, sounds like I have a family full of problems. Uh, but recently, I went through uh, also a, a journey of uh, pain and healing myself, and I had to see a counsellor. Uh, and I think that's where, you know, it's okay for us to talk about such things as a family. It's okay for us to explore resources, to say that, you know, maybe at this juncture, mom and dad, and that's what we said to our son, mom and dad might not be the, the best person to help you um, um, I think you need another outlet, an additional outlet, and maybe a you know just a, a third person <laughs> a perspective. Yeah, so um, those things can't happen if we don't create the environment for them to take place. Yeah, so I would say um, start somewhere. Yeah. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you, um, Gerald. Maybe yeah, I just like, quickly jump in here. I think the there's always this concern. Uh, I mean, being a church, right? We always wonder about the faith element. You know, when when a partner, you know, like agency like us work with the church. I mean. Caregivers Alliance is a secular organization, but uh, I mean, so we serve everybody. Uh, so what we have done with some churches is that, uh, I mean, where, where possible, we, we would have uh, some of our staff who are Christians to, to actually uh, either facilitate the training or, or to, to do the training. Uh, but even then, uh, we, we do not really want to uh, have too much faith element during the training itself. So what we can do is uh, we, can, we, we can get one of the church members to either before or uh, or after the training session, come in and, and, and do and, and perhaps do some sharing, do some prayers, and then perhaps as a closing to actually just uh, you know put in, I mean, come in with a faith element as well. So I think we can work together in this manner, and I think that that should work great. Thank you so much, um, Gerald and Danny and Joanna for your time this morning. If I could invite everyone to use your uh, reaction button to show your appreciation to the panel. Their organization is doing so much. Yeah, right. Yeah, clap hands, uh, heart shape, thumbs up. Thank you so much uh, for being with us, uh, panel members. We will now take a five minute stretch break again. Uh, and we will come back at 11.05 for a sharing by Reverend Dr. Keith Lai on the cross as a paradigm for mental health and wholeness. Now, this time during the break, you might see some prompts to go into the breakout room. Please ignore, okay? This is not the time for breakout room yet, okay? So do not uh, click on anything because we are just preparing the breakout room with uh, various speakers. So just ignore, enjoy your break, and then be back here at 11.05 sharp. So thank you so much. See you later.